right. So we've already needed to put you on the screen right now. So let's introduce you. Uh, this is Rich Colburn. He's a software designer and theolo theologian um, from the Theological Dark Web YouTube channel. Pleased yeah. to meet you, Rich. And you're Chris. My name is Christopher, and uh, I live in Toronto. Yeah. And we've had three hour talk on the phone and learned a lot about you and how my thought processes and my belief systems have actually changed with that conversation we had. Not all of it, but the whole yeah. thing on the atonement has certainly made me do a lot of thinking and that are we really thinking of the atonement the proper way? Because I would think of the penal substitution and he told me that was not right. And then that's that's a really volatile statement to say the the penal substitution is not right. So it, it takes a lot of yeah, if you're talking to anyone who is influenced by reformed theology, um, you're going to shut people down right away just by suggesting that there's something wrong with that theory. Because to most of them, that is the gospel. The, the penal substitution theory is what Paul is talking about and what Jesus is talking about and what the prophets are talking about. That's what everybody's talking about in the Bible in their minds. And to say that that's not the gospel, it's... Well, it's, it's really interesting because Martin Luther created this idea of, I guess he would call it sola fide, or in German, I don't know what it is in German. The three solas, it, sola scriptura, sola fide, and solus Christos. Yeah, there you go. And it's something different in German. But it's it's weird because it's this idea that you get into heaven not based upon, you know, what you do or what your character is like, or how you've lived your life or anything. But you get into heaven based solely upon what you believe. And what you believe in the minds of most reformers is a matter of what doctrines you've signed your name to. So if you believe in some version of the Trinity that's not the orthodox version in the minds of the reformers, then you have the wrong doctrine and you're in danger of hellfire. And, you know, it's, it's not going to make any difference what you eat on your cereal in the morning if you have almond milk or whole milk, what you believe about the Trinity. But And it's not going to affect how you treat your kids, and it's not going to affect how you pray, and it's, it's really not going to have any effect on the kind of person that you are or really on any aspect of your life, whether you believe that God is one God in three persons or... Um, one God who manifests himself in three distinct ways or, you know, whatever. Uh, but people argue about the kinds of words that you're allowed to use when you talk about the Trinity. And it's because in their minds, the doctrine that you sign your name to is a matter of heaven or hell. And when it comes to atonement, it's the same thing. Which atonement theory do you believe in? If you sign your name to the wrong atonement theory, then you're going to go to hell. So when I first started asking questions when I was at Moody Bible Institute, uh, you know, I, I'm not finding this in the Bible explicitly. Is there some passage that actually talks about this? Where does this idea come from? Uh, there were people who came to me in tears. You know, this one guy gave me a hug and he was bawling his eyes out. And he's like, oh, I love you so much, man. And I just don't want you to go to hell. And it's like, seriously, why would I go to hell for asking questions about this? And in their minds, it's because it's kind of like you have to know the secret password to get into heaven. What's the password to get into heaven? Jesus paid my penalty. That's the password. As long as you know that password, you get into heaven. You know, So you start questioning that, and the evangelicals, they don't want to even listen because to them, they have to keep believing that or they're in danger of hellfire. And if you come at them with questions that make them wonder if that's really biblical, they could lose their salvation just for thinking about it. But I mean, to me, it's so, it's just crazy the thought that sign your name to these arbitrary phrases and you get into heaven. A lot of it doesn't even make any sense. It's just a bunch of words. We're kind of going off, though, before I even, you know, got through introduction. <laughs> That's okay, Rich. Yeah, um, 
we had a gentleman uh, by the name of Bruxy Cavey. He's a teacher at one of our um, churches, and uh, he gave us the five views of, of, of the atonement. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I believed that God's wrath was placed upon Jesus, and then he shed his blood. And um, yet, it's not God's wrath is being satisfied by the death, by the death of Jesus. Uh, what would you say is the proper way, the proper way to view the atonement? Um, if if you want to be strictly biblical, the Bible refers to the atonement uh, most often as a revelation. So there's. I counted something like 120 something different passages in the New Testament that explicitly say that everything that Jesus came to do was for the sake of revealing, uncovering, explaining, manifesting, bringing to light, bringing out of darkness, showing, you know, etc. It's truth that people didn't understand before. So the, the atonement is primarily a revelation of all kinds of really, really important information that has the potential to transform you into a person who can have fellowship with God and who can be righteous. So it's it's transformative truth is what the atonement is. Okay. Just going to get some scriptures here. Um, uh, but um, so... I do read, I thought I saw one scripture verse that actually mentioned that it was God's wrath that was satisfied on Jesus. I don't know if I got that one correct. There's the only verse that would seem to, there's, there's a verse in Isaiah chapter 10 where it says he will see the, um, the suffering of his soul and be satisfied. And, you know, in the Hebrew, it reads something like he, he sees the travail of his soul. Travail is something that um, the travail of the soul, as I understand it, according to the rabbis. And you look at the phrase where it occurs in other places. It's something that you do in order to humble yourself before God. So it says he sees the travail of his soul and he is full or it's like this is enough. Um it doesn't say anything about the wrath of God anywhere in Isaiah. Uh, they just bring that out of nowhere into the text and say, see, the wrath of God is satisfied. Well, maybe his appetite for Cheerios is satisfied. Maybe his thirst for coffee. I mean, why would you just grab something the text is not talking about and say it's about this? There's, there's no basis for doing that. And, you know, that's primarily the problem. Uh, with all false teaching is you, you take an idea that you like and you want the text to be about that idea. So you add a word or change a word or assume it's talking about your idea, even though there's nothing that suggests it's talking about your idea. So, I mean, it's just, it doesn't say the wrath of God is satisfied. That passage is not about that. Um, there's really the only other um, and it's a grasp at straws. The only other grasping at straws to try to make the Bible say something about the wrath of God on Jesus is when Jesus refers to the cup that he has to endure. And, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, let this cup pass 